to give it its correct title, is Dugout Church Chests in Herefordshire and Worcestershire. Uh, thank you very much, Rachel, over to you. Thank you very much, thank you. Firstly, I just want to check that um, you can hear me okay. Um, is that okay? And have you got the home screen up just yet? Yes, we can hear you, Rachel, sorry. And hopefully in a second, you'll have the home screen ready. Yes, we have that. Great. Okay. Hello. Okay, welcome to my discussion about church dugout chests in the counties of Herefordshire and Worcestershire in the West Midlands. And thank you very much to the RFS for inviting me to take part today. I've been researching and recording church chests in the two counties for three years now, and I'm in the final year of my master's degree. Today, I'm going to share with you some of my findings, including details of the four dugout chests which have recently been dated by dendrochronology or treeming dating in the two counties. So the dugout chest pictured here is one of two in St George's Church, Orleton, which are both believed to be 13th century, both of which were tested as part of this project. But unfortunately, this one, chest one, could not be dated by dendrochronology at this time as there were not enough growth rings in the core sample to make a confident match. But I think you'll agree it's rather special with its split curl terminals and elongated kite-shaped hasps. So firstly, I know that Chris Pickens defined dugout chests a little earlier in his talk, but I'll reiterate um, what they are and what they're used for. Um, I will reveal how many dugouts survive in the counties of Herefordshire and Worcestershire, and I will outline the two main methods of cutting off a lid for a chest. And then we will take a detailed look at four of the dugout chests which have been dated by dendrochronology through kind funding from the Regional Furniture Society. So we'll look at their construction, their ironwork and other features, and I will be revealing the likely felling and conversion uh, construction dates that dendrochronology returned for the four chests. So a dugout chest has literally been formed from the trunk of a tree. And this very battered and worn chest is hidden away in the belfry of Foy Church. So I had special permission to, to go and see it. I had to climb up a very narrow spiral staircase through a tiny doorway to reach it, guided by the church warden. And there was absolutely no way that this chest was carried up the spiral staircase. So it had to have been hoisted into the belfry and then the floor fitted beneath it before it was then hoisted back down again. The main benefit of this type of chest over other types is their great weight, which make them very difficult to steal. And quite often they were banded by iron straps, making them difficult to prise open. Now, because they were usually made from green or unseasoned wood, they often split as they dried out, so that the iron straps were often to try and restrain this movement. They have a single or sometimes double, double cavity hewn out of the tree trunk. And sometimes this was quite small in comparison to the overall size of the chest. So given that most dugouts are between one and two and a half meters long, they have to have been made from quite a large tree. Now antiquarians and scholars in the 19th and early 20th century have denoted dugouts to the earliest phase of chest development. This was mentioned in a previous talk today. Given that their simple and crude design, believing that once the tools and techniques were developed to make other forms of chess, they were no longer made. But this research also challenges that framework, as will be revealed during this talk. So dugouts, like other church chess, were used to store church valuables and alms collected for the poor or to fund crusades. This is the only surviving medieval vestment in Northern Europe dated around 1480. It was hidden in a chest in the vaults of Christchurch Cathedral in Waterford, Ireland from Cromwell's men during the Reformation and was rediscovered in the 18th century. And it only survived in such good condition because it was hidden in an iron bound chest. The uh, injunctions of Archbishop Alfred, who died in 1005, tell us that dugout chests were actually among sacred items in churches long before the Norman conquest, after which various edicts were issued for their construction by the king or the 
the Pope. Now, for example, the 1199 edict, a papal order made by Pope Innocent III, called for hollow trunks to be placed in every parish church so that the faithful could deposit alms in return for the remission of their sins. The trunks were to be fastened with three locks and keys, one for the bishop, one for the priest of the church, and one for a chosen layman, so they each had to be present for the chest to be opened. Further edicts were issued throughout the 13th to the 15th centuries, some calling for securing of books and vestments, as already been mentioned, and some for the collection of alms. Whilst it would seem logical to try and assign a chest construction to a specific edict, it is important to bear in mind that early chests were adapted to comply with later edicts. Traditions of chess designs continued throughout the medieval period, and some are secular chests given to the church. It may be that dugouts were commissioned, were the only chests commissioned um, by, sorry, were commissioned only by the church, as I've yet to find any evidence for them in secular use. So if anyone knows of any, please let me know. So without dendrochronology, Day testaments for chests have been made by previous scholars based on stylistic characteristics like the way a chest is constructed, the size of the cavity or the style of the ironwork. This can be unreliable, given that styles can remain in traditional use long after fashions have changed. When assessing ironwork, it's very difficult to know whether it's original or a style copied by a later craftsman making repairs or altering the chest for change of use. So dendrochronology, provides us with a much more reliable method of dating, providing the requirements are met in there being no fewer than 50 growth rings and samples are undamaged by timber faults or woodworm. So dugout chests are good contenders for dendrochronology as they have accessible radial growth rings in their base and generally straight planks with square ends for lids. However, if these are tangentially sawn, they cannot be tested and I'll explain this further in my next slide. So prior to this research, only six dugout chests, to my knowledge, have been dated by dendrochronology in Britain to date. Dr. Andy Moyer of Tree Ring Services in the Forest of Dean carried out the testing of six dugouts in Herefordshire and Worcestershire during December 2020. Now, unfortunately, two of the chests did not return dates, so remaining funding from the RFS is available to date two more which we're hoping to do in the next few months. So we're going to take a closer look at the four dugouts, which did return dates in just a moment. But first, I'd like to elaborate for those who don't know um, anything about the different ways of obtaining a lid from a solid trunk for a dugout chest. There is evidence of on dugout chests that during the medieval period, only two methods were used. Um, prior to pit soaring and um, development of that and its use in the mid 16th century. Riving, also known as cleaving or splitting timber with a wedge and mallet, is one of those types, and that's shown in this picture here. And the second method evidenced on dugout chests is soaring over a trestle with a frame saw, shown in the second picture, though he appears to be soaring towards his bare feet which would leave modern health and safety um, horrified. <laughs> so there's a diagram from Chinese um, book, Oak Furniture, the British tradition, shows different ways of converting a log into boards. A, up here, illustrates the method of riving or cleaving timber radially, like slices of a cake, which provides slightly tapered planks and gives a more stable board and produces the most attractive figure. B illustrates straight sawing a log through from one side to the other. So from one straight way through, where planks near to the center are good quality and stable, whereas planks on the edges are prone to warping. And C illustrates the best method to cut planks by quarter sawing as much as possible. And here you can see that the majority of boards are cut radially and that produces the maximum amount of stable boards. D down here shows you the growth ring pattern on the end of the edge of a board or lid for a chest. And D shows you straight through and through sawn boards um, where the annual rings um, run across the width of the board from this edge to the other edge. 
and this is prone to warping or bananaing um, and creates some unstable movement. Whereas E here shows you a quarter sawn um, or ribbon board with annual rings that goes from one face, just my cursor, from one face to the other. And this produces a much more stable board, an attractive figure, but it also allows um, a core sample to be taken from the edge of the board or lid um, to proceed with dendrochronology. Now in my thesis, I go into uh, this in much more detail and different methods of sawing, but basic understanding of the methods is needed when we come to discuss the four dated dugout chests. So this map shows where the counties of Herefordshire and Worcestershire are in relation to England and Wales. You can see Herefordshire is just on the border of um, Wales and Worcestershire is just to its east. So there are 14 dugout chests in Herefordshire um, that I, I could find during my research. Um, and this represents about 11% of the total of church chests that I found. So this includes all the different types, um, boarded, only a few clamped, I think two clamped, um, and a lot of panel chests. So I did a survey of all of them and then narrowed down which of those dugouts. In Worcestershire, although it's um, a much smaller county, um, there were only just one less, 13, which represents about 16% of the total of 80 church chests that I found in Worcestershire. So there may be some more lurking about that I might discover, um, but uh, I did go in nearly every single church in the two counties. And just after the Second World War in 1947, a survey of church chests was carried out in Herefordshire by a chap called Morgan, but it only contained very brief descriptions and some monochrome photographs. However, no such study has been undertaken in Worcestershire, to my knowledge. Um, and this research is the first systematic study in the two counties, um, and possibly the first known study of dugouts um, in Britain. So let's focus on the four dugout chests that have been successfully dated by dendrochronology. This map shows the location of dugouts in the county and their relation to the market towns marked by black crosses and numbers. And you can see that the locations of um, the churches that hold dugouts are generally on the periphery of the county of Herefordshire um, and not really in the towns. I didn't find any in the main towns, market towns of Hereford, Lempster, Kington, Bromyard, um, but I did find them on the base of or on hill hillious areas, more rural areas. Um, number four, Hi. which is right down in the south of Herefordshire, marks the location of St Mary's Church of Foy, which I mentioned earlier as that very battered chest that was hidden in the belfry. Um, and position five, just here, below Hereford, marks the position um, of St Michael and All Angels Church in Kingstone, Herefordshire. And this is the first of the chests that we're going to take a look at. And here it is. Um, you see, it's a very impressive chest made of oak, um, 2,600 millimetres or eight foot five long. So one of the largest dugouts in Herefordshire. It has two very slightly domed lids, and these sit in rebates on the front, back, and right-hand end of the chest. You can see clearer in this picture um, how it's been cut in to sit flush. And I saw this a lot um, with chests in the counties. But this, the interesting thing is uh, quite a lot of them weren't set in a rebate on one end, either the left or the right end. And it's a bit of a mystery as to why that is. Um, so if anyone has any ideas, please let me know. Um, so the lid may have originally been one length and I'll show you why I think that in just a moment. But just to have a look at the ironwork, the lid has a wide double ended fleur de lis and two strap hinges. On, on each lid. Can you see here this very distinct double-ended fleur-de-lis strap with very sort of long-necked um, petals and the curl back here. And then um, on the other lid you can see another one here. And these straps appear to be bracing perhaps um, splits that have occurred in the lid because they're, they're not serving any other purpose. Whereas there are two split curl hinges on each lid. This one's had its a bit broken off and that one's in good condition and on the left lid here but the far left 
um, strap hinge is actually a single leaf. Now this may indicate that it's a, a later replacement. Um, so that's a possibility. You'll also note that there are the remnants of other straps, there's little bits of, of metal on the lid where the so hasps and straps have broken off. And it's a case of really sort of unpicking the puzzle of each chess biography through time and history. Um, another just interesting thing to note is that alongside the shape of the front straps, there are two of those on the ends of each lid as well, one there and one there. So quite a lot of ironwork. And remember that ironwork was fairly expensive at this, this time. We'll go into the date in a moment. So opening the lid, it, the lid opens to two sections divided by an oak insert. Um, and that suggests really, because this, this oak insert, you can see it's been placed in afterwards. It doesn't extend right the way down to the bottom of the chest. It, the wood doesn't match. Um, it's almost as if it's just been very crudely cut and, and, and banged in there. So I believe that originally the cavity was one, one whole single cavity. And that is why I think that the lid was also one lid. You can see on um, the left lid, some quite smooth strapping. The nails of these are very different to other nails on the chest. So again, I think these are later additions to try and restrain some of the movement that's taking place. It's worth uh, noting that underneath the right lid, there are two staples, and Chris Pickford's pointed these out um, earlier in his talk, and therefore a sliding bolt lock that would have been operated, I believe, by this large key hole on the front. It's uh, very difficult to see on the left. When we have a closer look at the locks, you'll see why. Um, but there are holes on the bottom of the on the underside of the left lid, indicating the position of perhaps another sliding bolt um, long since disappeared. So there's evidence for six locks in total. Now these were probably added at different stages of the chest's life. Behind and above the left lock plate, you can see new timber, new oak timber has been inserted to support this lock. And this left lock is quite similar in design to the right lock, and both of them have a very um, delicate stamped pattern on the keyhole guard. But I wonder if anyone spotted the oddity. This right hand um, lock plate is actually upside down. Um, whether this is deliberate or not, not uh, I'm not sure really. Maybe it was to confuse um, a thief in, in dim light. Or one explanation I've, I've thought about is that if the right lock plate had been fixed the right way up, there may not have been room on the lid for the hasp between earlier ironwork. So it may have been deliberately done in order to fit it in, who knows? So, but in both cases, the corresponding hasps are now missing. There's, there's nothing above them that links into the hasp pole, unfortunately. Um, there's also a staple just to the left of this um, lock plate here. And there are two holes um, which would indicate the position of another staple that's now missing. Um, but we do have a central staple and an existing hasp, which is lovely because it has this very interesting stamped pattern of a square with a cross inside and then these zigzag patterns. Now, again, if anybody um, knows anything about this. I've, I've done some research into it, obviously. Um, it may be symbolic, um, but it would be possible that all three hasps had this stamped pattern originally. I have seen similar patterns stamped on a church door at Foy in Herefordshire, and also on another dugout church chest in Lee in Herefordshire. So it may have been um, a local trend um, or style and, and possibly made by the same blacksmith. Um, so yeah, very interesting. <clears throat> also note that some of the vertical straps on the front of the chest are made of smoother metal. You see here, you compare that to the one next to it that you can see very clearly on this bottom picture how some of them really appear to have been cut out from sheet steel, I'd even go so far to say, um, compared to, where's my first one? 
some one of these straps here, which is clearly forged. You can see the hammer marks on the strap. And um, when I've watched a blacksmith work, um, inserting this nail actually causes the, the steel to, to bulge out like that. So it's a, it's a pattern created in the forge, whereas these ones have clearly been added later and made to look um, very similar. Um, and again, their purpose, there's an extraordinary amount of ironwork on this chest. It would have been expensive. Um, so is it is it decoration for a very rich parish or is it um, purely to try and contain the splitting and a lot of it added later? You can see also before we move on that that large keyhole on the front that would have operated the sliding bolt box on the lid I mentioned earlier. So looking at the ends of the chest, <clears throat> the growth rings of the tree are visible on the right end uh, and, and the left end. You can see here the position of the heart of the, of the tree, the center and all the growth rings. And even though there's quite a bit of woodworm, um, we managed to get a sample for, for dating. Um, the left end's interesting because you can see um, saw cuts. Um, I've enhanced it a little bit with uh, making it black and white so you can see that more easily. Um, but here you can see saw cuts changing direction and a very distinct tear off mark. So this um, tree has been cut to length, um, you know, even though it's very long originally. And the other thing is to note is these horizontal striations, which indicate axe um, dress marks. So it's lovely to have that um, story, if you like, imprinted on the end of the chest. So previous scholars have ascribed this chest to the 13th century, as does historic England. Now, Professor Jane Geddes, now retired from the University of Aberdeen, discussed the fleur de lis straps on the Kingstone chest in her book, Medieval Decorative Ironwork in England, and she denotes them to the second half of the 13th century. Well, they're all correct, because dendrochronology gives the felling and conversion date between 1243 and 1273, which is consistent with stylistic dates and comparative ironwork. So now let's look at our second dugout chest, which is being dated by dendrochronology. Now number 10 and 11 on the map, right up here in the north of Herefordshire, is the location of St George's Church, Orderton. Um, there are actually two dugout chests in this church, but unfortunately chest one, which I showed you earlier in my um, opening page, couldn't be dated, but the other one, chest 11, has been. So let's have a look at that. And here it is. So this, this um, quite large chest is uh, 1910 millimetres, or just over six foot long. Looking at the ironwork then, we've got a very wide strap that extends across the whole of the front edge of the lid um, and then extends part way, you can see where it stops here, um, across either end. There are two pin hinged um, hasp straps here and here and these actually pass for in, through a slot behind this front wide band um, and come out um, at the bottom there and they're actually cut slightly into the front of the chest um, and these have single leaf terminals. We'll, we'll have a closer look at those in a moment. Um, there, there are three hinges um, securing the lid and each have split curl or bifurcated terminals. You can see these here, here or those, that little one's lost a bit and this one's lost quite a bit more. <laughs> Um, they're mentioned, um, sorry, the, there are also three vertical straps on the front of the chest with similar terminals, um, though these have uh, very interestingly had what we call heraldic fleur de lis inserted behind each terminal. We'll have a, a closer look at that and you'll see how those, that one there is actually squeezed in behind the ironwork. This one sits in front of it and this one again sits just behind it suggesting that they were put in later. Now these are mentioned by Professor Jane Geddes in her book and a similar terminal can be seen on the clamped lesser treated chest um, at Westminster Abbey which has been dendrochronology dated by Miles and Bridge to between 1271 
um, and 87. Please, I know you're watching, let me know if I, if I misquote you. Um, so interestingly, at the underside of the left-hand end of this chest here, the timber has been cut away to form an angled ridge. Um, so this may have been created um, so that the chest could sit against a step, possibly, or another protrusion, but it does extend all the way across that left end, so it's been deliberately made. And interestingly, there's a similar ridge cut away from the other chest in the church, but on the right-hand end. Um, so whether they set, sat um, either side of the nave um, is um, something we can research. We can only speculate really about their purpose. So on the left-hand end, you can really see that that bottom section I've just mentioned cut away from the bottom of the chest all the way along. Uh, unfortunately, the right end is inaccessible as it's pushed right up against a pew um, and it's incredibly heavy to move, as you can imagine. So the lid um, is an interesting feature. I'm going to point out that um, it's actually tapered. This back um, section of the lid is thinner at the back than the front. So this suggests that it may have been riven so it may have been split from a larger bulk of timber by the wedge and axe method rather than being sawn, if you remember the methods I showed you earlier. Um, and it's also slightly domed at this end only. So it's likely that this has occurred due to movement of the timber rather than design. And you can see that an additional piece of timber has actually been inserted after that movement has taken place to try and keep the mice out. Now here's a close up of the split curl hinge um, and a slot next to it, which some, some might think was a money slot, but it's actually the, a keyhole, a very large keyhole into the lid. Um, and I'll show you the underside of that in a minute that confirms that. And we've also got a, a close up picture of that split curl hinge with the heraldic terminal inserted here behind and you can see how that's been cut to fit in behind it so it's obviously been added in later. So the chest opens to reveal one very large cavity um, and there are ads and even acts what I think are ads and axe marks again if somebody wants to um, add to this or contradict that that's that's great because um, they're not tools that I've personally used but I've seen other people use. And I believe that these scoops on the underside of the lid um, are ads marks. And then we've got quite a lot of striations again, which maybe act stressed marks on the lid. And you can see them as well very clearly in this detail. And the other thing um, you can see is that keyhole shaped slot, which is in location to the scar of a formal lock underneath the lid. Now this may have been a stock lock where the mechanism was set in a block of wood. Uh, but it would have had a sliding bolt which located in the staple on the front edge of the chest. Um, and you can also see where the hasp has been cut into the front of the chest and there are staples for the, for the provision of padlocks on the front. So previous scholars um, have dated this chest stylistically also to the 13th century along with the other one, but with later heraldic terminals. However, the results of dendrochronology returned a likely felling and conversion date of between 1347 and 1377 for the chest, which places its construction in the 14th century. Now, interestingly, this is just after the death of Adam of Orleton, who died in 1345. Now, he went from being Bishop of Hereford to the Bishop of Worcester, and he finally became the Bishop of Winchester, which is detailed in Philip Hume's book on the Trail of the Mortimers. The Church of St George's is also associated with the notorious medieval family, the Mortimers. So if the chest is original to St George's Church, it's possible that it was commissioned under Mortimer patronage with the heraldic fleur de -lis added later. And again, that requires some more research. So <clears throat> um, I shall be including some lined pen drawings of each of the dated chests in my thesis. 
uh, because this type of drawing reveals details of the chest that might be overlooked in, in a photograph. And it provides a very good way of understanding changes or differences in ironwork. Um, and the process of drawing actually leads one to observe uh, and understand the chest in a slightly different way. So it's a very helpful tool. So next we move on to Worcestershire. Once again, you can see that the extant uh, dugout chests are located on the periphery of the county, either on or nearby hills. All the black crosses mark the positions of the dugout chests. And again, they're generally away from towns um, and, and definitely the city of Worcester. So our third dated dugout chest is in St John the Baptist Church, Feckenham. And this is indicated by um, the number four, which is right over here uh, in the east of Worcestershire. And here it is. So this, again, is an extremely large chest measuring 2,360 millimetres or seven foot seven inches long. And uh, this oak dugout chest is the second longest in Worcestershire. Now it has two lids which overlap the base at the front and both ends. You can see that here and at the ends there. Um, the um, lids also overlap in the centre, which is the only example I've seen of this um, occurring in, in either of the two counties, which is very interesting. So what it means is that this left hand lid cannot be opened unless the right hand, um, sorry, the right hand lid, got it the wrong way around, can only be opened if the left hand lid is first unlocked and lifted. So that's extra security here. Now the lids are of similar length, but they do appear on close examination to be of different and perhaps more recent timber to the base. Um, you can see that the base is much more rugged than the smoothly planed and polished lid. Um, and on the front of the chest, there are four lock plates, one on the left half and three on the right half. These ha have hasps, which are hinged from straps on the lid. And there are also four vertical straps from a cursor on the front of the chest, two of which have um, double-ended fleur-de-lis and the other two just have a single fleur-de-lis. So let's have a, a closer look at the armwork on the lids. Each lid, as I've mentioned, has two um, hasps, has a hasp strap on the left and three on the right. You can see there in a bit more detail the fleur-de-lis. And each lid has two uh, strap hinges and these have a fleur-de-lis as well but this is quite a different type of fleur-de-lis and if you compare the half strap terminal um, of this one here which comes from over there with this one which is this one here you can see side by side how different they are. This one appears to have been um, cut from uh, with, with a chisel you can see there are sharp uh, angled beveled edges, whereas this one um, appears to have been hammered in the forge and it even has a little collar um, added to it. So um, the variation in design and quality of strap terminals suggests that again, they may have been made at different times or by different blacksmiths. Um, one could theorize that it was a blacksmith and um, his apprentice, but I think it's possible that the hinges are reused from the original lid, but that the half straps were made at the same time as the locks and the new lid were added. We'll have a little closer look at the locks on the front. So when you look closer at the lock plates on the right half of the chest, you can see that new timber has been inserted into the front. You can see where it's been spliced in, um, and there's even some sort of chunky attempt at dovetailing here um, so that, that that's sort of fixed quite strongly and then these straps have been applied over it. Also, the lock plates have been stamped and you can see, just make out in this detailed picture, Berm for Birmingham, I believe, uh, of the maker and the date here, very clear, 1827. So 
we can be pretty conclusive, which is lovely. It's very, not very often we have a, a, an actual date on replacement lock plate, which would make our life very much easier. Um, but it's obvious that these lock plates have been replaced in the 19th century. And it's uh, my theory that the lids were the lids were made and replaced at the same time, um, perhaps along with those straps for the hasps. So on the end of each chest, you can see the position of the heart again, or centre of the tree. On the left end, it's here, uh, very clear on the right end. And you can see where a strap's been added on the edge of the lid to try and restrain the splitting. Now, earlier, I mentioned the difference between quarter sawing and tangential sawing. Um, the lid of this chest has been tangentially sawn. So the rings span from the width of the lid. They go all the way across like that, rather than that way, if you see what I mean. Um, and from edge to edge, so they cannot be dated by gender chronology, as I said previously, um, as there just wouldn't be enough uh, growth rings to in the sample. So uh, again, this is evidence that the lid has, is perhaps a later replacement. So dendro chronology returned a date for the base, because we could get a sample from the base, of between 1435 and 1465 for the felling and conversion of the chest base. Now this date does not correlate to any particular edict. Um, Chris Pickwins talked about the size of the chests um, and I, it's my belief that because this is a large chest um, with two compartments that it was made for books and vestments. <clears throat> now last but not least, we'll look at our fourth chest to be dated and this one's in St. Lawrence Church in Lindridge in Worcestershire. Um, so you can see um, in this map, again, the um, crosses are on the periphery. And if we come over to number seven, which I've lost currently, here we go. Right over in the west um, of Worcestershire is where Lindridge um, is located. And it's worth just saying that the present church at Lindridge was built in 1862. Um, replacing a Norman church. So this dugout chest measures 1290 millimetres or four foot two inches long with a single lid and has no rebate, uh, but the lid just sits flush on the top of the base. On the front edge of the lid, there are three angled looped hasps and staples aligned with three staples padlocks. Now, two of these, if you look carefully, are in the scars of former hasp, um, which would have corresponded to these lock plates. You can see here very clearly the scar in the center of an old hasp, which is no longer there. And very clearly here where this loop hasp sits in the scar that would have once corresponded to the lock plate. Um, whether the lock plates are original or not, it's, it's very difficult to determine. It's possible. Um, but this indicates conclusively, really, that the loot hasps and staples are later additions. So the single cavity is centrally placed with sloping sides. And um, this chest, I thought I'd leave the, the toys in for this picture. It's the only example I've seen um, with uh, sloping sides. I haven't come across a chest cavity that's sloping. Other um, chest cavities are vertical. Inter they have vertical internal walls, um, but the contents of this chest demonstrate the change in use really, quite ironically, um, from sacred medieval church chest to a present day storage chest for children's toys in the children's corner of the church, which I find quite ironic. Um, they've been very demoted over the years. Um, you'll also see that the exterior surface of the chest, including the lock plates, has been painted with um, a wood effect raining. And this was a technique commonly used in the 18th and 19th centuries. Obviously the, the hand isn't a, a permanent feature of the chest. So you can see on the left end where the heart of the tree is. Very clearly here, you can see shakes coming out from it. But um, you can also see this shape carries through from the lid to the base, and it's therefore formed from the same trunk. Um, and on the lid, you can see two strap hinges securing the lid, which extend down the back of the chest and terminate in a single 
leaf, the left strap is very much longer than the right one and very much larger. So again, this suggests the possibility of either it being made by a different blacksmith at the same time, or it's being made at a different time um, and indicates that it's a replacement. Again, it's very difficult to actually know, but it's fun trying to unpick the biological story, the biographical story of the chest. Now, loop paths were made throughout the medieval period, so they're not particularly helpful in making date estimates. However, this chest has been dental chronology dated to between 1519 and 1549. So let's sum up what, what we know so far. In conclusion, we have four chests that have been dated in Herefordshire and Worcestershire. We've got Kingstone, dating from the 13th century. Orleton II, remember there, there's chest one and chest two, this is chest two, dating from the 14th century. Then we've got Feckenham, dating from the 15th century. And lastly, Lindridge, dating from the 16th century. We can tell that each chest was made from locally grown trees because the samples match to locally collected uh, chronologies and data. And it's perhaps surprising that the Kingstone chest is the oldest, yet it has the most intricate ironwork. And that the Lindridge chest is the simplest in design with simplistic ironwork, yet it's dated as the youngest of the four. It's very important to take into account the evolution of a chest through its lifetime. Straps, hinges and locks can be replaced and added, and lids get cut in two to conform to changes in use, change edicts. The dental chronology dates provide us with a span from between the 13th and 16th century. And this demonstrates that contrary to the belief that dugouts were the crude, simple and easy uh, chest to construct, that should therefore be ascribed to the earliest period for church chests, they actually persisted the longest amount of time from pre-Norman right through to post-Reformation. And evidence shows that they continued alongside other types throughout the medieval period um, as late as the 17th century. So this paper intends to demonstrate that consistent and systematic recording of chests surviving in parish churches very much needed to form a chronology of the various styles of dugouts. They are so different um, and their ironwork. County studies of church chests are vital to further our understanding of how important these artifacts were during the medieval period. I've included the references, some of them overlap with Chris Pickfence's um, talk. He, he's mentioned Johnson and Geddes. Um, but I hope this has given you a taster of dugout church chests, uh, which I go into much more detail in, in my thesis, which I hope to publish for, for all to read. But uh, my research seeks to raise awareness of the importance of, of church chests and how they evolved and how people related to them, particularly given that so many of them are overlooked at the rear of churches in present day and they're filled with Christmas decorations, or flower arranging stuff. Um, it's very, very sad. But thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed my talk today. Thank you very much indeed, Rachel. Um, may I lead the virtual applause for your paper, which was really brought out the materiality uh, of the chests. And again, you covered a great deal of ground, raised so many interesting questions. We have, uh, as a group, 10 minutes uh, for questions on the afternoon papers of Chris, Noah and Rachel. And um, I'm going to go through comments that have been added to the chat briefly, um, although, of course, you should all be able to see those. One reference um, to the um, publication by Stefan Baumeier, uh, a really landmark publication, which I can thoroughly recommend, having used it myself, on Westphalian um, standing clamped type chests, um, a late example of which you can see in the furniture gallery at the V&A, or at least you will be able to see when the museum reopens uh, towards the second half of May. Uh, so there are details that have been provided 
there by uh, our colleague Heinrich Stewer uh, on how that book can be obtained. Um, secondly, um, a question for Chris Pickvance from Helen Caton Hugh. You mentioned the possibilities of use being books, money, or vestments, and you looked at chest size in relation to vestments. Is there any way to evidence one use over another other than size, uh, Chris? Well, you know, th this is a tricky one. Uh, I think uh, when you think of storage capacity, there are three things in churches. There are cupboards, uh, there are chests, and there are uh, ombries. Ombries probably be smaller things uh, in, in wall, wall safes, as it were. Uh, the problem is with uh, knowing about this, uh, that the, the recording of chests is, I think, uh, hit and miss. I think some, some recording finds a lot more chests per church than others, uh, even in neighbouring counties. Uh, I compared Norfolk and uh, uh, Ely, I think, yeah, yeah that, that neighbouring. And uh, <clears throat> so, you know, the actual evidence uh, at the level of uh, uh, church records is, is really not very adequate at all. I, as far as the books are concerned, well, I mean, there are <clears throat> in uh, Salisbury Cathedral, in what's called now the Song School, there is a, uh, an iron bound chest, which is uh, chained to the wall which they say is a book chest. And that's really quite relatively small, probably about uh, 18 inches to two feet high. Uh, <clears throat> and it's up on its end. And the very small size perhaps would argue that that, that indeed was a, a book chest. Uh, but obviously the size of books, well, we've seen from Nick's paper that the size of the books could be anything from really quite minute, the sort that would go in a little, uh, traveling uh, uh, chess you know, uh, coffers of some sort to really quite large books with uh, uh, antiphonals and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> so I mean, my feeling is that given that there are far more types of object than uh, types of than, than places to store them, that, that many chests must have been for multiple uses, that there must have been lots of things stuffed into the same chest. I mean, I think one has to say that this must have been a bit awkward if you were trying to store really beautiful vestments. Would, would, I mean, those might well have been in a separate sort of chest, but I think once you get down to smaller items, they could easily be rel relics and uh, candlesticks and all the smaller items could easily be placed together. So I think that that would really defeat any attempt to, to say that certain sizes must be for, for certain purposes. I think vestments are the one thing where, and processional crosses is the other example of something really quite specific that needs a very long, rather narrow chest. And there are certain examples of that. Uh, there's one at uh, Chichester Cathedral Treasury, for example. So I think, uh, you know, there isn't a simple answer. But vestments, I'd say, were most likely to be in these not quite long chests. But the, the eight foot six one we've just uh, seen from uh, Rachel, I mean, that's, well, that was divided into two, I think, wasn't it? Or at least later. So, I mean, I think one of the interesting things with chess is the way that divisions are created at certain points, partitions, and usually they seem to be later, but not always. And that presumably is to do with the changing uses. Uh, for example, uses for parish registers in the 16th century came in. Uh, so I think that there's a chap called Leonard, uh, uh, Schatzman, who wrote the book on buildings, uh, building in England till 1540. He wrote some articles in the Sussex Archaeological Collections that tried to record uh, the contents of church chests. I think he was hoping this would become a big trend, but as far as I can see, it didn't take off. And so his articles are some of the very few which look systematically at what was in chests. Uh, Chris, thank you very much. Um, as time is short, I'm just going to move on, draw your attention to Martin Bridges' comments that old carbon dates can now be re-examined using a new technique which may narrow the range. Um, 
uh, <coughs> a question to Noah from Agnes Boss. Have you found any evidence of former painting on the chests you've been looking at? Um, yeah, I, I, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, short answer uh, is no. Uh, a slightly less short answer is no, but there has been a commentary on some uh, liminal red minim powder that was found in the farthest most interstitial spaces of the Quartri chest. Um, uh, that was used uh, against it by some of the, the more vocal detractors in the mid 20th century, especially in Belgium. But as far as I've been able to suss out, that red minimum powder was actually a byproduct of early um, uh, uh, um, casts that were made of it at the Royal Armories, circa the 20s and 30s. Um, uh, but as it comes to like actual extant polychromy, I... Um, uh, when when Chris and I uh, were doing um, kind of field work on the on the Hardy chest, um, uh, I, I couldn't really see anything too obvious. But they're both so worn and so faded um, that it wouldn't surprise me because especially there there are many uh, French examples um, uh, which which I'm, I'm I'm sure you 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 may be well familiar with that are in full polychromy, um, especially when it comes to kind of um, more kind of liturgically focused and narrative low relief carvings um polychromy everywhere uh, for, unfortunately mine are much less uh, flashy uh thank you Agnes. did you want to come back on any yeah, on any so of that i know we are very short in time but just to say that um you know i've uh in my powerpoint this morning i showed um um a facade of chest very close to the hatish chest and um there, there there were no analysis um undertaken on this piece but um, there, there is a suspicion that um, it was um, that there was a polychromy, so it would be mm. interesting, you know, to be in touch about um, yeah, this. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think you're absolutely correct. Like, I would be shocked if there was no polychromy because they put paint on everything. Um, but you know, thank you so much. Uh, another question for Noah: Is the depiction of left-hand soldiers to make easier for the carver to display their weapons? Yeah, no, once again, phenomenal question. You know, Verbruggen was also very much of that belief that the, the left-handedness is is a symmetrical um, uh, kind of, um, uh, 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 it, 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 it is much more to, to facilitate a certain symmetry in the carving of the court chest because there very much is a left-right flow dynamically. Um, uh, personally, uh, I think that that could be the case. There are instances where the designer of the chest very cognizantly breaks that motif uh, immediately next to the left-handed soldier who's decapitating the, the robed individual is a soldier wielding his sword in his right hand in a very awkward, angled, figurative pose um, that very much runs counter to any symmetry. Um, but I would say that even if it is a question of symmetry, then it's a very cognizant choice being undertaken by the designer. Um, but that is is an excellent observation. Um, uh, so, so thank you much for the question. Um, thank you, Noah. Um, for Rachel, um, a mention of the German chest dated by Dendro to 1132, a dugout chest uh, with a reference to the Baumeier book. Uh, I, hope, yeah. I hope you can see the chat yes. there. Yes, thank you. Uh, and uh, you've, you have responded I see. Um... I, I responded to the question about uh, pit soaring. Um, I was very careful to try and find a picture that just showed uh, one man soaring on trestles because uh, the evidence shows um, that pit soaring didn't actually come in until around 1540, 1542 in Herefordshire. Um, and there's a fantastic paper written by Duncan James about this subject, which I've, I've re referenced basically. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and there's a comment used about uh, heraldic fleur de lis from Jeremy Rycroft. Yes. Austin's feathers ringed by a coronet. Yes, fabulous, thank you. Um, well, it is now 4.45, which is our um, end uh, of the day. Um, I would just like to take up a, a minute more of your time, please, um, to express our collective delight that so many people have been able to join the day um, and to attend from so many different regions um, throughout the, the, the world, I'm sure, once our American 
friends are able to pick up on the recordings. Um, that's a very appropriate geographical range, given that the subject of medieval furniture transcends national boundaries in so many ways. May I thank all of the speakers for today, um, and also those who've put in a great deal of hard work to organize it. Jeremy Bate, our events organizer, Julian Parker, website editor, who's kept the technology on an even keel to our great relief, and to Liz Hancock, newsletter, to, newsletter editor, um, for setting us off at the beginning of the day. Um, I would like to draw everyone's attention, please, to the Regional Furniture Society um, uh, newsletter, which comes out twice a year and includes um, shorter articles and book reviews, um, submissions warmly welcomed uh, on the subject, on all related subjects to uh, regional furniture, please. Um, as I mentioned, the papers have been recorded and should be available afterwards. Please check the website where you'll find also information on future events, the free online archive of back issue articles published in regional furniture, details of how to become a member if you're not, uh, the different rates which start at only £20 per year. Um, and I think that covers the main essence of my duties, uh, unless anybody else wishes to add a last word, I will terminate the day's session with thanks and good wishes to all those who've been with us. Thank you.